Um, next, I want to introduce Abha Lamba. She's a conservation architect uh, with her own practice in Mumbai. She works all over India, uh, helping uh, from Ladakh to uh, Karnataka uh, to Orissa. She has the uh, distinguished uh, uh, meant of being the only uh, private contractor that has ever been given a, a, co a contract to work on a national uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site for the planning uh, by the ASI uh, for the sites of uh, Ajanta and Laura. Um, I would love to uh, uh, introduce Abha Lamba. Well, what I'm going to talk about today, in a, hopefully within 10 to 15 minutes, is to really give you an overview of conservation issues, challenges, and opportunities in India. And as we know, India is a very vast country. Uh, okay, that's mine. And uh, GHF is, uh, I've been working with GHF now for almost eight years on a project uh, in a very special site in India, which is uh, Hampi, the World Heritage Site, in this heart of Karnataka. And uh, we've got, okay, what oh, seems to be. And another one in the eastern edge of India, within a very strongly tribal district, uh, the site of Maluti in Jharkhand. Now, these are both really, uh, remote sites, they're even hard to get to very easily. For Hampi, you need to fly into Bangalore and then take an overnight train or drive for something like 12 hours. And for Maluti, again, there is just no direct connectivity and one has to go either through Ranchi or Calcutta and then uh, take a train and then take various modes of transportation to, uh, to get to these remote villages. Uh, but when we look at the 21st century, uh, one of the greatest challenges is urbanization. And when we look at a, a country like India with its imploding population, we've already crossed 1.2 billion, uh, a very, uh, a huge and intense pressure on our uh, buildings. And if you see this, the Victoria Terminus in Bombay, the city where I c come from, uh, we've got buildings which you, the footfalls every day on this historic Gothic structure is two million people coming in and out of it every day. So the huge pressure on this living heritage is really something it's difficult to even comprehend. Uh, and that's what is important to understand that perhaps in this century we need to have a mind shift, a, a change in the way heritage and conservation has been seen for so many years. This is a classic example. This is, I mean, this is what the picture postcard view of, of uh, the Taj Mahal has been for, for hundreds of years. Uh, the question is, are we doing enough for sites within India? And is Taj just the top of the pinnacle? And is there too much focus on these grand monuments? Because when you see the, the, the entire breadth of India, and there are just 3,800 nationally protected monuments. Uh, UK has 100,000 listed sites which are protected, and that is the size of Uttar Pradesh, probably one of the states in India. But when you look at a country as vast as India, is 3,800 enough? And that leaves the rest of the hundreds of thousands of monuments, sites, ancient towns, medieval cities, unprotected and victim, and at least uh, greatly threatened by developmental pressures. Uh, the other question is that because of a certain, you know, Victorian uh, legacy of that was adopted by the government of India in its in its cultural vision, we've been rather monument specific. So it's it's been looking at monuments in their grand isolation. So while the Taj Mahal is an individually listed site, uh, what we forget to manage or to really protect under a larger urban zone is is the urban context of the Taj. And had it, the picture to the, to the left would have been a reality because had it not been for a public interest litigation in the year 2002, the entire riverbank opposite the Taj Mahal was to be developed in this grand scheme called the Taj Heritage Corridor by the state government. And they had proposed building malls and glass facades and aluminum uh, uh, structures all over that entire riverfront. So this is what we, would, we have been left with. Uh, a similar example is the one on the right, which is a beautiful medieval Islamic Sultanate period monument within the city of Jaunpur, um, just an hour away from Banaras. And while the monument is actually a nationally protected monument, if you look hard enough, you can see a little um, steel railing going around by a meter. 
And that's it. The, the, the government has fenced it off with a little railing a meter across and says, we've protected this building, but around it we have an electric transformer, um, a public urinal, a pawn shop, which is like perfect material, like you, know, you buy your, your, uh, uh, your pan and you go spit on the monument walls. So it's, it's really a complete breakdown of urban planning, which today is threatening heritage in India far more intensely than, than abandonment or issues of neglect. And then uh, to the left again is this wonderful site in, uh, this is, I don't know how to use the, uh, the um, laser. This is the site of Jaisalmer, which is one of the most fantastic forts in the, in the state of Rajasthan. And yet we allow unregulated signboards, uh, hoardings, advertising to completely take, o take it over. And that's the time when we realize that we need to make a choice in a country where education, uh, basic amenities, healthcare are still something that we are grappling with. Culture seems very low on, on the national agenda, and that is where we need to look at sustainable cultural policies and beyond the monument-centric approach to look at larger urban settings of towns and historic districts. Uh, in 2007, uh, I was consultant to the Rajasthan government uh, for the Shekhavati zone, and we looked at a whole district of, of Sikar, uh, which is within the, the most beautiful historic uh, zones of Rajasthan. We have these old merchant havelis, which are courtyard houses of great, great wealth of, of uh, artwork and paintings, and yet just outside it, we have a complete breakdown of, of urban infrastructure. There's absolutely no solid waste management. Uh, they decided to put electrical cables and the whole electric transformer bang opposite the biggest Char Chokki Haveli. And that's when you realize that in the developing world, we've been just putting putting different departments in watertight boxes. So you have the planning department which sits in one little watertight compartment which won't talk to the heritage guys, who won't in turn talk to the, to the people and they wouldn't think of even looking at economic incentives for it. So this whole thing works in sort of isolated compartments and the moment you lay your cobblestone paving in this historic uh, uh, settlement, the next day around the telephone guys will come up and dig it all up and put their telephone cables underneath. So that's, it's I think a South Asian reality if not an Asian reality which we, we need to really look at. Um, and that's why towards the beginning of my career I was very clear that I did not want to close myself in this watertight uh, compartment and I wouldn't want to work on these isolated monuments and their grand design and ignore the, the urban setting. Um, one of my early projects in, was in the city of Bombay, which is really the city which tests any kind of paradigm on culture, conservation, urbanism. It's a city of a population of nearly 16 million uh, in a really narrow promontory of, uh, of a, a coastal town. Uh, this was, was a, uh, an urban district called Horniman Circle, and which had a lot of problems with rent control. So people were still paying a dollar a day to own, uh, to, re to lease out prime property in South Bombay, but they weren't really responsible for looking after the building, which was the job of, of the owner, who obviously wasn't getting any money. Uh, so we, a group of uh, us got together in the city and, and did a, a little walking tour and realized that within this district were 22 major banks. So we went to each bank and just asked them for $2,000, which isn't really much to begin with. And for this first project, which was a multi-tenanted building, we were able to raise uh, about $1,000. And with that money, we, we managed to clean up the facade uh, and, and convinced the, the shopkeepers that these signboards that were all across uh, the arches could be cleaned up and just placed more efficiently. Uh, in 1998, so almost 14 years ago, uh, I was commissioned by the, by the city government to prepare an urban streetscape scheme for the most congested commercial district within Bombay, which is Dadabhai Naroji Road. Uh, we had to prepare drawings of each and every uh, facade because there were none. We, we did the mapping over uh, nine months and then prepared a very simple uh, a, a guideline which explained to shopkeepers how if you had an arch, you could just place your signboard within that. Now that's like just simple logic and nothing beyond it. Uh, but it took, uh, it took 
almost a year to convince the city government to do something about it. And in one of three, in, within one year, three municipal commissioners had changed. And by the time the third one slept through my presentation, I just made up my mind I wasn't going to do it this way. I went to the local level, the, the lowest officer in, uh, in the hierarchy, who's a ward level officer, and I convinced him that he would send out a letter to every shop owner to come on an appointed day to attend a presentation. So 150 shopkeepers came uh, together. There was a, it was a random bunch. There were some bankers, some uh, some corporations and some regular shops. And uh, I made the presentation to them explaining that this is how your building looks and you've got four arches and four signboards and let's just clean it up. And one man got up and he said, all right, by Diwali we will do this for our, sh um, our shop. And another got up and said, well, we will do it too. And within a matter of two meetings, we formed something called the Heritage Mile Association, which was India's first Main Street program, so to borrow a page out of uh, the American uh, uh, terminology. And what we managed to do is uh, we actually went to McDonald's and shamed them into changing their signboard because I carried with me photographs of McDonald's at the Parthenon and said, you know, you can barely see the M. Uh, but is it just because it's a European country that you're willing to tone down your signage? And uh, we finally got them to, to change it to this. And we, could, we didn't realize that we hadn't, as a city, seen these arches for so many years because they'd just been completely covered over. Uh, greater negotiation was for, for buildings like this, which was a heavily multiple tenanted building. And I remember spending one whole Sunday standing in front with all the shopkeepers in the you know, blistering heat standing outside with me and saying, OK, Ghulam Bhai, will you please remove your signboard from here and put it to the next, you know, the fourth from the left? And he would say, no, but my shop is here. And there was a, a great amount of negotiation. But we managed to get this done without getting one penny from the government. Every shopkeeper paid for his own signboard. And to this day, the, the committee is now 11 years old. It's older than my daughter. And they meet every Monday in one of the shops uh, in, on DN Road. And they have paid for the street furniture in front, of, in front of their buildings. And then one very brave gynecologist, a Parsi lady, filed a suit in the, uh, in the Supreme Court uh, asking why hoardings and billboards were allowed in heritage precincts. And she won the case. And once these hoardings were removed, we managed to see the entire city breathed a sigh of relief. It was like a collective, oh, we never saw these buildings behind it. Because some of them, I mean, you almost thought that the billboards were holding up the facades rather than the other way around. Uh, another, we, we tried out another model of conservation because we knew that the government wasn't going to be pouring in money. And this was a very, very important neo-Gothic building designed by Sir Gilbert Scott, one of the leading architects of London, who was so busy at the time that he never deigned to come down to Bombay to build this or to even see the site. So uh, he built this in the 1860s, but all, all through a series of letters. So the, the senators of the Bombay University would send him letters explaining the the climate, and he would write back saying, oh, would you like a westerly breeze coming into your veranda? And so it went on like that. And this entire beautiful building was built really like a church. I'm sure he'd got some church cathedral plans lined up in his office that were wasting away, and he's probably sent them around. But this grand convocation hall was built uh, really like a church. Uh, when we drew up the plans for this building, we were running short of money. And we realized that we needed, uh, we, we needed four times the amount that the university had. So finally, we went to a local corporate, the Tatas, and uh, convinced them to put in the money. And at no more cost to the government, we were able to restore this entire stained glass. We managed the entire ceiling uh, in the 1940s had been sprayed with asbestos in somebody's you know, crazy idea to improve the acoustics of the hall. So our first job was to just remove truckloads of asbestos and, and make this building safe for, for breathing, and then restore the lighting, the stained glass, uh, remove all the, the you can see uh, all the uh, 
tube lights hanging around. There was PVC conduits running across all the carvings. And we were able to restore this within 10 months of receiving the funds. Um, and finally, when the president of India came to inaugurate this building on the 150th year uh, of, of the university, uh, my greatest award was when he came up to me and said, your building smiles. And I think we all did. Like, the whole city smiled that day because we didn't have to wait for central government funds for this project. Uh, now, coming back to the whole idea of monuments, by the time I was, I was appointed by the government of India to prepare a management plan for Ajanta, I think I'd spent already 15 years of my career looking at context and looking at urban sites. And that's where it became so important that I, though the, the UNESCO nomination and the inscription of the property for Ajanta just mentions the caves, we can't limit it to this 30 caves. And currently, if you, we see the buffer zone for Ajanta, it is only that little circle around the caves. Uh, the greatest concern is that when you, when you look at Ajanta, this is one of the last surviving sites where you don't see urban context. You just stand in this, the middle of this wonderful forest which comes alive in the monsoon. And you can imagine why the monks chose this site for its, for its peace and its beautiful you know, retreat. And the moment we don't allow the buffer to protect the, the viewscape around it, this is what's going to happen. Because some collector is going to come and say, let's put a trolley track. And someone's going to say, we need a high trans, you know, uh, HT cable to run through. And we want water supply. And the little local village panchayat would want a, uh, you know, a multi-storied uh, village uh, panchayat hall. And that's the reason we've been able to now convince the government to expand the buffer zone for Ajanta from 65 hectares to 4,000 hectares. And that's now been accepted by the central government to allow this to be protected as an entire site on its own. And now coming to the GHF project closest to my heart. Uh, this project I've been associated now with nearly eight years. It was 2003 when Jeff chose this spot. And in this wonderful site of Humpy, Jeff chose the most difficult site because Humpy is like hard rock, very stable. And he decided to pick a 15th century temple that was crumbling away in the center of the only river island in Humpy. Uh, well, it is a breathtaking site, but how do you get Every bit of stone, uh, which is two tons, has to be ferried across. And the only way to reach this site is through a little basket boat. It's a coracle basket that you sit in and paddle away. So uh, when we started the project, this was uh, it's sited on two levels of stone embankment. They were crumbling away. And because of severe flooding of the river over, over years and years and centuries, uh, what had happened is that the entire soil settlement had allowed the, the temple walls to be pushed out. And that was literally threatening uh, the collapse of the main temple. Uh, this temple site is really important mythologically as well, because it's a Shaivite site. It's a 15th century Shiva temple, which stands on a Vaishnavite site. So this is supposedly the mythical land where Lord Ram is first said to have met Hanuman. So it has huge sacred geography significance. And there are pilgrims who walk for miles to come and see this temple and just to walk around it. Uh, we've when, when we look at this site, we know that this is the only way to reach it through the basket boat. But there was, at one point on the right, you can see in the purple dots, there was once an ancient stone bridge that linked the temple to the mainland. And that itself talks about how significant the temple would have been. Uh, we started in 2005 with an archaeological um, ex excavation and an exploration project. It took us one year before that to get the central government to sign off and allow archaeology, since this is within a, a World Heritage Site, which at that point was, uh, was uh, declared by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site in danger. Uh, we completed a season of archaeology and then signed up the memorandum of agreement with the state government. And unfortunately, the day the memorandum of agreement was signed, our archaeologist died. He died at the signing day. We lost our, our, our archaeologist on the first day. And uh, soon after that, our site supervisor fell and broke his knees and his, his elbow. So everybody used to start calling this like one of those jinx to Tankhaman sort of sites. And we really did have a puja on site because the labor wouldn't begin work. They were just so panicky. It's now been, uh, when we started work, the local government was very keen that we look at the temple and we beautify it and restore it. But the GHF team, which it includes 
John Sande, Jeff, uh, John Hurd, and me, we were all very clear that we were not looking for a beautification and sort of a you know, beautifully restored temple. The temple has a history of, of willful destruction as part of, his, of its history, because in the 16th century, when the Islamic Sultanate took over, they actually willfully destroyed these temples. And in fact, the shivaling that we, we found on the site was broken in 20 pieces and scattered across the site, which spoke of the desecration of the temple. What we were interested in is to conserve and consolidate the stone embankment so that they don't slip back into the, into the river. And that's how we worked on. Uh, our greatest challenge, these are photographs before and after of, of the work. As you can see on, on, at the upper level, you can barely see, you just see rubble up on the up, upper embankment. And here it's been completely consolidated. Uh, so this is how we began. We were able, there was this huge transmission line that needed to be relocated. Uh, and today the steps have been put back. We still, this is the east face. Uh, the entire east faced embankment had collapsed. And through very, very syst uh, systematic archaeology, numbering of every stone, we've managed to put this back. Um, as you can see, the, the local, the sadhus are, are very happy with the very fact that they can be on this temple. But through this entire project, we've only, we've not used one drop of cement. There's been no concrete. We've only uh, replaced missing pieces of stone because they used to be salvaged for, scavenged for new buildings in, in the area. So we lost about 10 percent of original stone in the lower embankment and about 20 percent in the upper embankment. So overall about 15 to 18 percent new granite stone with matching petrography was brought in, laid just using the same traditional techniques of dry masonry without any um, concrete or cement being used. And uh, now with that temple complete, uh, the next project that GHF has identified is this wonderful temple village in Maluti, which is these carved terracotta temples in a village community which has 60 of these wonderfully carved temples. Uh, as you can see from this, this is a cluster of the temples and we've man mapped each and every temple and the problems that arise. Uh, the wonderful uh, project, uh, the challenges of this project are it's, there's no electricity, no water connection, no, no primary health care, no educational facilities. And yet, uh, because perhaps of this great backwardness, these temples survived. And our challenge with this GHF project is to be able to conserve these temples, but at the same time work on with the community on reviving these craft skills, getting just a basic primary health care plan in place, um, and being able to empower the local community to, to sustain these temples and their heritage in the long run. Thank you.